Hey guys, it's Bella and this is a video I'm very excited to make for you guys um, and shout out to everyone in the Gutawigs community on the Gutawigs Discord for just being awesome people and supporting my channel. Um, so this video is going to be about how to read medieval manuscripts in the Gothic language and I'm going to look at actually both scripts in which the Gothic language is written even though um, even though runes obviously aren't written in manuscript and I need to clarify here so the reason I'm saying literae gothice and uh, literae runice instead of um, litera as we do normally is I want to distinguish it from litera gothica which is a medieval script there's because there's so little evidence for how gothic was written paleographers don't really have terms for it, the script in the same way that there is for the latin script um, because you can almost as easy just refer to the manuscript itself to refer to what kind of script you're looking at um, and for that reason I'm going to mostly try to refer to the Wolfilian Gothic alphabet as the Achseberka which we'll see why it's called that in a bit and obviously the runes will be the runes and this picture here is of a mo um, mosaic from Ravenna showing the four gospels um, because it is suitable given that our Gothic Bible is mostly how we know about the Gothic language so, the Gothic language and migration. Gothic is the earliest Germanic language to be attested in sizable quantities, and this is largely due to manuscripts of the Gothic Bible produced in its Ostrogothic Italy, surviving to the present day. And it's also the only member of the East Germanic branch of the Germanic language family. The origin of the Gothic speaking people is unclear, and the reason I'm saying Gothic speaking people instead of a more sort of specific ethnic term like the goths as in ethnicity is because speaking gothic doesn't necessarily correlate all the time with a gothic ethnic gothic ethnicity or even distinct ethnicity as we will see in the writings of historians um however there are two um historical sources which give an opinion on the origin of the Gothic speaking people. Jordanes claims in his poem The Getica that the Goths originate from Scandinavia, whereas um, Procopius claims that they come from Scythia, although it should be noted that Scythia is sort of a, it's just a sort of place where barbarians can come from. It's a very suspect region in the Greco-Roman imagination, so this doesn't really say very much. and. Starting in the 4th century CE, we have Gothic-speaking peoples migrating into Western European regions, and we have the Ostrogoths founding a kingdom in the Italian peninsula under King Theodoric in 493 Common Era, while the Visigoths settled in the Iberian peninsula under King Euric in 466 Common Era. So the Ostrogoths are, in terms of the etymology of their name, basically means the um, Western, sorry, the um, Eastern Goths and the Visigoths are the sort of Western Goths, although there is a bit of controversy about the Ostrogoths because their name could actually come from a Latin source meaning Southern Goths, but that's a different, that's a story for a different time. And this map here shows you the migrations of the Goths into Western Europe. And it's just an important thing to point out here that um, although the initial groups of uh, migrants would have included Gothic language speakers among their ranks. We don't have very much evidence of the Gothic language surviving in the Iberian Peninsula. There's no references to um, translators, there's no reference to church services. We don't have, to my understanding, um, Gothic language manuscripts produced uh, from Spain. Um, they, the Gothic-speaking peoples who arrived there seem to have very quickly adopted the Latin language, whereas in Ostrogothic Italy we do have some references to a language which King Theodoric refers to as lingua nostra, which is associated with his military camps, the military being especially associated with the barbarians and with his incoming army. And part of the reason why um, it would have been so easy for the Gothic-speaking people to assimilate to the Latin culture is, if you imagine it, um, it's possible, although not provable, provable, that given the fact that the Odorex army and the other Gothic forces coming into Spain and Italy were armies, they were they did sort of engage in military campaigns. They would have liked to be composed mostly of men, and these men, when they settled and sort of 
had families in Italy and Spain, they would have taken wives, obviously, from the Italian and Spanish surrounding countrysides, and these wives would not have been Gothic speakers, most likely. Um, and therefore, their children might have been raised bilingual, but I think chances are much better, especially in the context of Ostrogothic Italy, if a child isn't raised either to join the Aryan Ostrogothic Church or to join the barbarian military, they would be raised in a context where Latin is the language of everything. All of the incoming Gothic speakers would have learned and spoken fluent Latin. King Theodoric himself spoke fluent Latin. Um, so they would have been in a context where Latin was useful in every context other than the military camps, and everyone in the military camps probably already spoke fluent Latin. So there would be little reason for them to need to learn or to maintain their Gothic language, and this is one of the reasons why it went extinct in Italy and in Spain. The Goths, initially, like any Germanic people, wrote their language using the Elder Futhark runes, and this is a writing system developed by Germanic-speaking peoples, the oldest test description being on the Vimosicom, and that's from the, the, the first century Common Era, and they're of quite obscure origin, the runes, but they seem to have um, derived from some kind of um, Italic alphabet with influences from Greek scripts, but you know, it's hard to say and it's a very complicated subject that I'm not going to treat in that much depth. Um, there are some Gothic runic inscriptions because the Gothic speaking peoples, like most Germanic speaking people, use the Futhark alphabet for writing small inscriptions on talking objects, and most of these do not survive because they were written on perishable materials such as wood. Um, however, we have to bear in mind the matter of when the Gothic language, how sorry, how young the Gothic language itself actually is. So, by the time that we have these earliest Gothic runic inscriptions, so the sort of three hundreds, four hundreds common era, the Gothic language hadn't actually diverged substantially from Proto-Germanic language, meaning that it can be quite difficult sometimes to identify whether an inscription is Gothic or Proto-Germanic, and because of this ambiguity, although there are several proposed Gothic inscriptions, there are only three which are broadly accepted as being truly Gothic inscriptions, and these are mostly associated with some kind of magical or supernatural effect, and we're going to have a look at these objects in a second, but I need to point out quickly that while some of these inscriptions may have been magical in nature, the runes were not necessarily a sacred script and they didn't have any magical association on their own. They were just one language which, in which magical incantations might be written. The Romans and the Greeks had magical in inscriptions and such like in their own alphabets as well. So here's one in the, co the Koval Spearhead. God, speakhead. Um, and the inscription reads, um, Tilarids, meaning sort of well, literally sort of riding towards, um, or sort of pointer, and this is maybe a sort of good luck charm, hoping that the spear will be able to catch its target, and this is dated to around the 3rd century Common Era. Here is a spearhead from Damsdorf and Münchenberg in Germany, sorry if I've butchered that, and the inscription reads Rania, meaning a router, meaning the sort of member of a hunting party who sort of directs, I believe, who directs the animal to be captured. And I think this implies that the spear was probably used in hunting, and the geometric symbols might have functioned as a kind of hunting magic. And here is one um, from a bit closer to our time, in terms of the Ostrogothic kingdom at least. So we have the Buzo talk, again, sorry for butching that, um, which was found in Pietrasa in Romania, and it's dated to around 400 Common Era. The inscription reads, Guteni we Hele, and um, the it was broken by a Hungarian um, goldsmith in, I think, the 19th century, but earlier transcriptions record that the rune which is now broken was an O, so it would have been Kutaniowi um, Helak, and this has been interpreted to mean sacred to the Gothic women, so Gutani of the Goths, um, like Gutane in, um, in Wolfilian Gothic, we, and then that will be some sort of the Proto-Germanic wife, um, origin, and Hele, holy. You can, we can see the connections in here. And that's the inscription in terms of what it looks like when written out. 
here also is not really um, runes, it is Wolf, Bishop Wolfila's sigil, and it gives us an inroad to talk about Bishop Wolfila, who led a mission to Christianize the Gothic people who hitherto had been pagans before the 4th century Common Era. And after various struggles facing persecutions from the Gothic king Athanaric, um, Wolfila eventually led his followers to settle in Moesia, um, which is sort of, I believe, it incorporates modern day um, Romania, Bal several Baltic countries, etc. And in Moesia, he created the Gothic alphabet, which was to be used by a team of translators under Wolfila's supervision, who worked to translate the Bible into the Gothic language, which was the vernacular tongue of his people. And here is the alphabet that he produced, which is called uh, the Achsaberka. And the main source of inspiration for Wolfina's Gothic alphabet was the Greek unseal alphabet. Although certain letters, such as the Fehu rune, I noticed that the names for some of these um, letters, at least, seem to mirror in some ways the uh, runic names. Although we'll get to the matter of how we know these names later on. Um, but anyway, certain of these letters may have been borrowed from the elder Futhark, such as the F, um, and also the H is, as an example, quite obviously drawn from the Latin alphabet. So there are at least three alphabets which are influencing Wolfila in the creation of this script. And it's worth noting that because the main source of inspiration is Greek, the Gothic letters actually also function as numerals, and we can see this in uh, the Book of Ezra, which is, I believe, the only bit of the Old Testament, aside from, I suppose, the Psalms, which are carved into a wall in Magra Cain, which we'll see later on, but it's the only bit of the Old Testament recorded in a Gothic language manuscript, and there are various sort of numbers for the, um, I believe it's the number of sons of each of these Old Testament figures, and in the book of Ezra we can see the Gothic numerals being used as, the Gothic letters rather, being used as numerals, like in Greek, and there is one rune, which is the, well, it's down in the bottom right hand corner here. It looks like a sort of arrow, which is just a numeral. It doesn't have a sort of phonetic value. Interesting also is the um, the X, which it's whose phonetic value there is given as K, but frankly, its meaning is debated. It's not quite sure. It's a very interesting one. My guess would be that it approximates the Greek K, like in uh, Christos, but it's it can be a bit confusing. But let's let's move on. Because the Gothic alphabet um, derives predominantly from Greek, it uses certain diphthongs to represent sounds, and these mirror the same patterns in Koine Greek. Um, but philologists dispute the exact value of these diphthongs to some degree. Some people believe, I believe, it's a minority of scholars believe that the diphthongs are true diphthongs. The others believe that. They represent single phonemes, but only in certain environments. It's complicated, but the basics of it are that the AI represents E, like in bet, in most environments. The AU represents an O in most environments. Uh, the EI represents an E sound in all environments. And the um, joined up um, Gs or GK, they represent the consonant Ny. So like in the, um, goodness, I believe it's the um, Greek word Angelus, which I'm fairly sure is loaned into Gothic also. Because the Gothic script is written in scripsio continua, which is sort of writing without any spaces between, diuresis is frequently added to the letter I in initial position, sorry, wait, yeah, in initial position, to distinguish it from final position I, so that you can tell when a word is beginning. So it's worth knowing a bit of context, history for context, about the Ostrogothic Kingdom in Italy, because it is this region and time whence we get almost all of our evidence for the Gothic language. So beginning under King Theodoric the Great, the Ostrogothic government had been patronising the Aryan Christian Church in Italy, which seems to have cultivated the Gothic Achsaberka script in order to distinguish itself from the Catholics of Italy and Byzantium, whose liturgical languages were Latin and Greek respectively. In 553 Common Era, the Emperor Justinian defeated the last Ostrogothic King Thea in the Battle of Montlactarius, and thereby he ended Ostrogothic rule in Italy. 
After the takeover, the Emperor Justinian enforced Catholicism and may have persecuted Arian Christians, and this had the result that books associated with Arianism were destroyed or erased and rewritten. Some of these palimpsests, and we'll see what that term means later, survive to the present day. And this is why so few manuscripts written in the Aksaberka script survive to the present. Carlo Fadomini, in 2015, has described two varieties of the Aksaberka script attested in the manuscripts. We have an upright and a slanted variety, and you can see the upright variety from the Codex Ardenteus on the left-hand side, and a slanted variety from the Codex Ambrosianus B on the right-hand side. And it's very interesting to note that the contemporary Ogival Magiscule of the Greek alphabet around the same time, so the 5th to 6th centuries Common Era, has likewise has an upright and a slanted variety. So it might have been that Ostrogothic scribes were influenced by contemporary Greek unsealed scripts in the production of their own manuscripts. Like contemporary Latin script, it was written in Scriptura Continua, so there was no space between the letters. And the reason for this is because readers of Gothic manuscripts were expected to be fluent speakers of the language, and therefore they would be able to identify where one word ended and another began. Latin texts also at this time were written in scriptio continua. Ostrogothic scribes appear to have brought practices from the codicology of Latin texts into the writing of Gothic ones. So these include large capitals in the margins to mark the starts of passages or paragraphs. It's this is in opposition to using, say, a different kind of script, which Latin scribes would use in later centuries. The use of comma and commata punctuation is also a feature borrowed from Latin codicology, and this is where clauses and larger semantic units are separated by sort of little dots between words. So basically your clauses will have points between, little dots between them, and it's not quite the end of a sentence, but the end of a larger semantic me block of meaning will have two dots to mark a more final end, or they will simply sort of end that line of text early in terms of its position on the page and start a new line to indicate a larger semantic unit has begun. Gothic script is mostly written with a thick nib, but when space became constrained, scribes could switch to a thinner nib. Some of these scribal practices include abbreviations. It's worth noting, though, that the Aksaberica as a script seems to have served some similar functions as the Latin and Greek unsealed script, meaning that it's the main bookhand of the Arian Christian writings, and it had formal associations. So because of this, abbreviations are quite few in Aksaberica texts, and the only common one is a vision of final M and N, which Latin manuscripts did all the time. It's very interesting to note, actually, that as Latin manuscripts were doing it, in actual spoken Latin of the time, they were also losing the final M and possibly final p position M, N as well. And if you want to learn more about the, pronunci the likely pronunciation of Vulgar Latin in the Ostrogothic Kingdom, I recommend my book, um, Manuscript Deep Dive on the Ostrogothic Cookbook, which will link be linked in the description of this video. In Gothic language manuscripts, however, certain nomina sacra, which are sacred names or terms of holy figures such as Jesus or Lord, figure terms which occur over and over again in the Bible, which is where we get most of our Gothic from, these names are commonly abbreviated in order to save space because when Jesus said to Jesus' disciples that Jesus is the one true God, we know who Jesus is, we know who's talking, we can just give a couple of letters. So the, the four common inscriptions are uh, G and the thorn, I, I can't remember the Aksaberica names, Mia Maxima Corpa, which is abbreviated from Guth, meaning God, Fa, abbreviated from Freya, meaning Lord, Is, abbreviated from Jesus, meaning Jesus, and then Chs, abbreviated from Christus, meaning Christ. And I've given you these examples all in the nominative case, but Gothic nomina sacra inflect for case just like the Latin ones, so... Um, for goof, if we were to write in the gen this, this nomen, sacru nomen sacrum in the genitive form, we'd probably write G thorn or G D S to indicate the I S, um, the consonant of the I S ending, which has been incorporated into the nomen sacrum but still abbreviated. Now, the reason we know the names of the Aksaberg, which I am, which I have just forgotten, 
<laughs> it's because they are recorded in a manuscript composed by Al Queen of York, who was an 8th century scholar who joined Charlemagne's court at Aachen in 782 Common Era. And in this court, he had access to the Codex Argenteus, which is the largest surviving manuscript in the Gothic language. And he probably also had access to other books in the Gothic language. And from these books, he recorded the, the characters of the Axeberga and he listed their names. And this is how we know what they are. Now, fascinatingly, Alcuin records variants on certain letters, such as A and N, sorry, A and U, and some of the letters he records are different to how they are presented in the Codex Argentae. So the the A that he, the Axa that um, Alcuin records has a line joining the two, which is not a common feature in the in the other surviving Gothic manuscripts that we have. So to me, this speaks of the existence of more varieties of the Gothic alphabet which we have recorded, and some of these new letter forms seem like they're suited to cursive writing, and in my opinion, this might imply the use of Gothic in less formal documents, which would have very big implications for the extent of knowledge of the Gothic language in Ostogothic Italy. And fascinatingly, in terms of knowledge of the Gothic alphabet, here you can see um, the Achseberka in the middle, and you can see the um, the names that Alfred has, sorry, that Alcuin has given for them, and you can see variants of as well. So there's two variants on the A, three variants on the B, two on the D, etc. Um, and Alcuin actually knows a bit about how Gothic is um, pronounced. So he says, "Ubi dicitur." Okay, okay. Well, I'm going to because this, this is, I'll explain why this is complicated. I'm going to use my sort of ecclesiastical pronunciation, but I'll explain what the problem is. So, ubi dicitur genuit ye ponitur, ubi Gabriel ga ponunt et alia his similibus, ubi aspirationem ut dicitur yachlibeda, yachlibeda, diptongon ai pro e longa perche qua ponunt. So, what this means is. Oh no, I didn't translate that. It means that where they say genuine, they put a J, and where they put Gabriel, they put a G. Now, Gabriel in medieval Latin is always going to be a hard G, so it makes sense. However, um, this genuine is more problematic because it's a sort of palatalized J sound in ecclesiastical Latin, like how I pronounce it, and in earlier vulgar Latin, it would have been a hard G sound. Um, so clearly it can't be the hard G sound because um, that's what he says later for Gabriel. The letter the letter J rather cannot represent the hard G sound. However, um, I also don't know if it represents the palatalized just sound. It's possible. It's possible that wh whoever was informing Alcuin about how to pronounce Gothic, possibly a sort of converted Aryan priest for all we know, um, or just somebody who was familiar with the tradition, they might have by that time started to pronounce the y yes sound in Gothic as a j, which would be really interesting. But again, we don't sort of, we can't prove any of this. Um, and like I said earlier, the fact that Alcuin Folk was familiar enough with Ostogothic orthographic principles to record how to pronounce the diphthongs suggests that there was at least some tradition of spoken Gothic surviving into the 8th century. However, this isn't very conclusive evidence for cursivity in the Achseberica, and therefore the lack of conclusive evidence for minuscule forms in the Achseberica script written in Ostogothic Italy, with the possible exception of the variant form of the S, which looks a bit like a Greek sigma. And this variant is seen in Codex Ambrosianus ABD, the Bonanensis Codex, the, Veron the Verona Biblioteca Capitulare LI49, and also the Naples deed. However, with the exception of this sigma variant, the lack of conclusive evidence from minuscule forms in the Axeberica suggests the Axeberica was not commonly employed in the writing of more quotidian texts, which would in Latin utilize minuscule and more cursive scripts, such as the writing of charters or personal names. I'm sorry, personal memoranda. Although any conclusions about the nature of Axeberica script are of course tentative at best because we have so little evidence to base this on, it would imply that the Gothic Axeberica script was mainly employed in formal contexts by the Aryan churches of Ostrogothic Italy and it always had a sort of religious association. 
So let's now look at the Codex Argenteus, and I'm actually going to show you a picture of it here that you can look at. It's really beautiful. So the Codex Argenteus is by far the most substantial manuscript that is written in the Gothic language and surviving to the present day. However, we do is not complete, so we have several folios that are in fact missing. It likely survived because its beauty and opulence precluded it from being destroyed. The text is written in silver and gold ink on purple parchment, which is the most expensive form of parchment that you can get. And due to the lavish quality, it's likely that the Codex Argenteus was produced at Ravenna, and it might have been used in the palace of King Theodoric. It could have been King Theodoric's personal Bible, given how well, how incredibly luxurious it is. It's possible that only the king would have been able to afford such a product. And it is likely because of this beauty that it was transported to King Charlemagne's court at Aachen in the 800s. And you'll notice just in the top left hand corner, we can see some early modern, um, or rather sort of Renaissance 1500s, 1600s script of early scholars trying to decipher this mysterious language on this manuscript. It's really beautiful stuff. Going completely the other way and showing you something much less formal and much less pretty, we have the Naples deed. And I do apologize that I can't find a better facsimile of it. This is the only image you can find of it online. But anyway, so the Naples deed is a fifth century Latin deed written on papyrus and preserved today at Naples. And at the bottom of it, there are four Gothic signatures. Now, Patrick Amory points out that the Gothic signatures are very formulaic. So literally in the Gothic signatures, the wording is exactly the same in each of the four signatures, and only the person's name changes each time. And he suggests that this shows us that the Gothic language in Ostrogothic Italy was a liturgical one rather than the common Gothic vernacular, because the Latin signatures of the other witnesses to this sale of land are actually much more um, ordinary. They're more, um, they're fluid. They show more. Also, they show more phonological fidelity, as it were, to, to everyday speech. They they show some orthographic mistakes, suggesting that reflecting how a person is speaking rather than how they write. Whereas the Oster the Gothic rather signatures are all perfectly spelled, suggesting that somebody is copying them out of a book rather than speaking a sentence and then writing it down. Now, this deed shows a variety of the slanted Axeberka, and it's got a couple of cursive elements. So mostly we can see that some of the letters bite into each other. Now I believe, if I understood correctly, this would be an A and an I biting into each other here. And there are several examples of this in the Naples deed. And these are some early elements of cursivity, but it must be pointed out that Unseal scripts at the same time also did this, especially with endings such as NT. They would often merge these two letters together. So biting letters can still be a feature of sort of capital scripts as well. So this doesn't mean that we have evidence for like huge quantities of cursive writing being produced in Ostrogothic Italy. And I think the fact that this is the only record, except for the transcription of the erect so deed, whose papyrus hasn't survived, but that would be the Naples deed and the Arezzo deed. We only have two witnesses of the Gothic language being used in, being used and possibly produced for for business purposes in Ostrogothic Italy. I think this shows that even within the Aryan church, the language of trade, the practical language of daily life was still Latin and not Gothic. Let's talk lastly about a palimpsest because it's the Naples Deed and the Codex Argenteus are two of the few non-palimpsetted manuscripts of Gothic which we have surviving, but it's really important to learn about palimpsests, and these are texts which have been erased. So as I said, all manuscripts containing written Gothic are palimpsests, with the following exceptions, so that's Codex Argenteus, Codex Ambrosianus B, the Naples Deed, and the Codex Ceturnensis, which is like a small fragment. A palimpsest is a manuscript which is made from parchment whose original text has been scraped away and had a new text written on top of it. So the old text is called the scriptus inferior or underwriting and the new text is the scriptus superior or overwriting. Attempts at elucidating the scripti inferiores were often made in the 19th century by the destructive application of chemicals and I believe most commonly was a tincture of gall which 
often leaves a blue stain on the page and sometimes it completely destroys the ink. There's a really tragic, um, there was a really tragic trend in the Victorian era of one of these tinctures being made which would make the underscript, the underwriting, show up in very bright colours for a little bit and then scholars could make transcriptions of it but then it would literally sort of just like burn through the paper and destroy the text and on some manuscripts it's quite amazing actually you can um you can see where they've applied this tincture to make a text clearer and then sometimes just the areas where there was text have like corroded and fallen away because of this chemical they've applied to the manuscript it's quite tragic now, thankfully, modern paleographers have much better techniques to try and identify underwritings without destroying the manuscript. The most common one is multispectral filming, but sometimes actually just looking at something from a different angle or um, applying different kinds of digital um, filters to an image can actually help you to perceive the text better. And in fact, I believe almost all of the pictures of Gothic manuscripts I've used in this video have actually been, I've slightly modified them, I turned up the contrast or the brightness so you can see the gothic text itself more clearly. So the Codex Carolinus is a very worthwhile uh, palimpsest which it's worth talking about. It is a palimpsest of a bilingual gothic latin gospel book from 6th century Italy and it contains part of the first letter of St Paul to the Romans. We only have one page of this um, from the original manuscript surviving, unfortunately. And we know that it is the fifth page of the manuscript, for reasons we'll see. This, the fact that we have a bilingual codex surviving shows that although Gothic was a prestigious liturgical language of the Aryan churches, even within these Aryan churches, they might have been conducting some services in Latin, or they might have still felt the need to train their scribes in in writing and reading classical Latin. It was, it was clearly not even the case, even in the Aryan churches, that Gothic was the only language being used. Now, another interesting feature about the Codex Carolinus is that the Gothic text is on the left-hand side of the page, which is the more prestigious text, and the a vernacular version in bilingual. Um, facing page translations from the medieval era would quite often be written on the right hand side. But So this does suggest that even though Latin is being included in these Aryan services, they're still recognising the sacredness of the Gothic Latin script. And the reason that the Aryan churches in Italy dove so strongly into this may just well have been because it was something that made them stand out from their Italian Catholic brethren in terms of ascetics because in most other ways the Ostrogoths left very little trace in terms of art and architecture so Ostrogothic buildings seem to have looked the same as Italian buildings from before. The only building that looks any different is um, King Theodoric's mausoleum which has this weird yurt-like appearance. Um, the Aryan Baptistry and San Apollinare de Nuovo are two cathedrals founded by King Theodoric but these just look like Byzantine churches, they look like Roman churches from the same time period. So the Aryan churches needed some things to make themselves stand out visually from their Catholic Christian comrades, and the use of the Gothic script is one of them. And you can see here how the script has been overwritten with a Latin text in later centuries. So, let's move on to the Crimea, where the Gothic language seems to have survived a bit longer. So the Gothic language survived until around the sort of 19th century, 18th century perhaps in the Crimea. Algerius Gislenius Busbequius in 1740 describes the existence there of people speaking a Germanic tongue which might be Gothic and he recorded a small word list and a song of these people. And carved into a cave near Maghreb in the Crimea, archaeologist Andrzej Vinogradov and Maskim Korobov, forgive me for the pronunciation, in 2018 they found graffiti which are dated no later than the 9th century common era, written in the Achseberka, and they contain passages from a part of the Gothic Bible that's not otherwise attested. We don't have a manuscript of this passage. And this is Psalm 76, 
um, verses 14 to 15. And this Gothic graffiti lies among several Greek inscriptions also. So this shows how there were sort of multiple liturgical languages being used in the Crimea at this time. And interestingly, it's remarkably similar to the attested Gothic manuscripts in terms of the Gothic graffiti. And this suggests that the Achsebergas religious associations caused it to change less over the centuries. It was a very um, conservative language in the Crimea. And we can see a sort of altered ver photo of this wall with the Gothic text sort of highlighted in black. And it reads, well, if I try to read it, it'll be Aguth Miria uh, Aguth Mikil Iweguthin, and then there's a bit of a damage, and then thin Sil Silda Lika Ust Dan Us Ustlothim Ustothim Yach in Yach in Midi. And some of these I can understand, so, um, where are we? Uh, Guth Mikil at the top, so uh, Guth Mikil is sort of O oh God Almighty. Um, we have Sildalika in the third line, sort of marvelous or wonderful. Uh, and the other ones I can't translate off the top of my head, but you know, other people who are better than me can certainly do this. And this brings us actually to the end. We have now looked at the main, we have sh seen how to read. Lang manuscripts written in the Gothic language, um, few of them though they are, and I've actually given the links here to five um, facsimiles of Gothic manuscripts online where you can go and you can look at the images of these manuscripts and read them for yourself. Um, two are of the Codex Argenteus, I actually recommend the printed facsimile because it's easier to read, you have the Codex Carolinus, um, the Vatican Biblioteca Latina MS 5750, which contains the text of the Skirines, um, a biblical commentary written in Gothic, and lastly the Bolognese fragment, which is really exciting. It's sort of a a Gothic hymn or a prayer or a spell, and the, the distinction between them is hard to say, but I think it's a spell of some kind. Really interesting stuff, the Bolognese fragment. Highly recommend you check it out. Um, there's a transcription on the Bolognese website also. Um, so these are the links to follow if you want to get some practice of transcribing text. And we'll just have um, a last look as we go. I'll, you can pause the video to look more closely if you want to at some of these beautiful Gothic manuscripts. And thank you guys for watching so much. Um, I hope you guys in Gutawix have enjoyed this. Shout out, um, go and join the Gutawix Discord following the link in the description below. I will leave one there for you. Um, thank you very much. And go on a dach.